Okay, folks, I think we'll get started back again. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Ed Elliott, who will be talking on uh, what is Lewisian interpretivism. Cool. All right. Uh, so I'm just going to jump right in. So, uh, and I'll start my timer as well. So today I want to talk about radical interpretation. And um, in particular, I just want to ask a couple of exegetical questions about this paper, Radical Interpretation. Um, and I'm going to be focusing in particular just on the sort of mental aspect of it. So in that paper, Lewis talks both about how do we get the, uh, the beliefs and desires out of the physical facts, but then also how do we get interpretations of meanings and so on. I'm just going to be focusing on the beliefs and desires. So when I talk about interpretations, I'm literally just talking about you know, how do we go from some physical basis to an assignment of beliefs and desires um, to agents and so on. And the story that he gives us in radical interpretation is based on two key principles. Um, the first is the principle of rationalization. I'm just very roughly representing it here. It says that we're supposed to assign beliefs and basic desires to some agent so as to maximize their pragmatic rationality given the facts about their behavior. And the second principle, this charity principle, very roughly, I've sort of broken it down into two main parts. The first part says that we're to assign an agent beliefs in such a way as to maximize their epistemic rationality given the facts about their life history of evidence. And then also we're supposed to assign basic desires which are appropriate for the kind of being that the agent is. So Lewis likes to give the example that we better not be assigning desires like a basic desire for a saucer of mud because you know, given the kinds of things that we are, that's just not the sort of things that we actually want. So we've got these two principles of interpretation and a question that comes up a lot when people are reading radical interpretation is how do these two principles interact with one another? So in particular, what happens in cases where they pull in different directions? Just as an example, just imagine that Carl has no significant evidence whatsoever that there is a monster in his closet, and he's got, in fact, overwhelming evidence that there isn't. On the other hand, he always acts in a way that would clearly be very well explained by high confidence in the existence of closet-dwelling monsters, and quite clearly he has a desire, or at least it's plausible to assign him a desire not to be eaten. So what are we supposed to do? It looks like if we take the principle of rationalization in this sort of case, uh, then we're going to be saying that the best thing that explains his behavior or makes it pragmatically rational is a high confidence in there's like a werewolf in his closet. But if we apply the principle of charity, we should be assigning a low confidence that there's a werewolf in his closet. So it looks like they're pulling in two different directions. It looks like they're bringing each other into conflict. And this interaction question, as I mentioned, just crops up in a lot of places. Uh, so you see it in Patrick Maher's Betting on Theories. Um, Erickson and Hayek have a discussion about it. In fact, they have a particular way that they think he solves this, and they use this as a problem for Lewis's theory of radical interpretation. And a very recent paper by Hadi and Gadi also is basically focused on this interaction question. And there are a few obvious strategies that you might say, or a few obvious things that you might say about what happens when they pull in different directions. One might be maybe they're supposed to be traded off against each other. And then you've got to ask, you know, are they supposed to have equal weightings? Is one of them supposed to have some priority? If they're going to have some priority, what sort of priority should it have? And how can we justify giving that priority? And that's a very simple sort of model. Another kind of model that you might have for how they aggregate would be a lexical priority situation. So perhaps, for example, the thing that you're supposed to do is first assign an interpretation that maximizes the rationalization uh, of their behavior. And then to the extent that that leaves any indeterminacy, you use the principle of charity to sort of filter between those and work out whichever is the most charitable from what's left. So that would be one where, lexi sorry, where charity is sort of lexically subordinate. So, and obviously those aren't the only strategies. There's infinitely many different aggregate aggregation strategies that you might use. And it seems like a really important question, right? So if you've got this thing where, you know, at least um, in a lot of cases it's going to pull apart, then the specific way in which these are supposed to interact is going to give you different outputs for what the correct interpretation is. So it seems important, but the, literally the only thing that Lewis says about his view on how they interact in radical interpretation is the following. He says, using the physical facts, both as a source of information on Carl's behavior and as a source of information on his life history of evidence, fill in his beliefs and desires completely by means of the rationalization principle and the principle of charity. All right, that's, thanks, thanks, Lewis. Like, that didn't really tell us what we're supposed to do in these sorts of cases. And I take it that a good answer to that first exege exegetical question should at least plausibly also give us an answer to the second question, which is why didn't Lewis say more about this? This seems pretty obviously important to the theory, so why didn't he tell us a little bit more? So in the remainder of the talk, I want to argue two things. First, with respect to question one, just how do they interact? I'm going to argue that Lex, uh, Lewis held a lexical priority view. 
but it's not the lexical priority view that I just described before, because, well, it's going to be a lexical priority view between causal and non-causal principles of interpretation, where those two different types of principles aren't going to be well captured by what I've just described before. Uh, then second, I'm going to also argue that Lewis didn't discuss the interaction question because, and I think quite rightly, he considered the issue to be of very minor importance. So, quite clearly, if we're going to try and understand what was really going on, on in radical interpretation, the first thing that we should be doing is looking to the postscripts for that, where he corrects and sort of lays out some more details of what he was saying. So the very, very first thing that he says in the postscripts is essentially that the way that he was describing his theory of interpretation uh, just gave too much to Davidson's particular way of framing the issues and framing the theories. He literally just says, you know, um, I, I, I put it in Davidson's terms and I shouldn't have done that. And the thing that he spends several pages talking about um, is mostly that the way that he describes his theory is that it's too individualistic, so it's focused just on an individual, the interpretation of an individual. And then he doesn't, he's not as explicit about this, but the other thing that also becomes clear in postscripts is that his theory, or the way that he understands his theory, is not so much as an interpretation of persons, but rather an interpretation of physical states. So I'll give a quote and then I'll say a little bit more about what I mean by those things. So one of the early things he says in postscripts is, I stated my problem in an unduly individualistic way. Given the facts about Carl as a physical system, solve for the facts about him as a person, his beliefs, desires, and meanings. In Mad Pain and Martian Pain, I argued that a madman might be in pain not because his state occupied the causal role of pain in him, but rather because the state occupies that role, for the most part, in members of the kind to which he belongs, and the same possibility should be recognized for the attitudes, the beliefs, and desires as well. And I should note, since I haven't mentioned it yet, You've all got a handout. Uh, the handout comes in two parts. One is the sort of techie bits, just so that you don't have to write those down. And then everything else is a bunch of quotes, which are all relevant. I'm not going to read out all of those quotes, because there's a lot of them, and a lot of them are quite long. But you know, if you think that I've said something egregiously wrong, I've got the interpretation entirely just off base, then hopefully I've given you the information there in which you can tell me why I've made those mistakes. You don't have to go searching for it yourself. So the, uh, the important takeaway points from this early section of postscripts, I take to be the following. First of all, interpretation involves, in the first instance, assigning contents to states. And in New Work for a Theory of Universals, he says that these are most likely going to be states of the brain, uh, but they need not be states of the brain. They just have to be physical states of a person. And they have to be, for reasons that we're going to be comparing them across individuals, they have to be uh, identifiable across individuals as well. So in most of his later works, he talks about assigning entire systems of beliefs and desires, or graded beliefs and graded desires, credences and utilities, to total physical states. And from now on, I'm going to be using this pair, Bell and Des, to represent just systems of beliefs and desires. And you should be understanding them roughly as probabilities and utility functions. Uh, he does, as I said, he always talks about assigning uh, this whole system of beliefs and desires to total physical states. But in that same passage, he also talks about you know, assigning individual beliefs to partial physical states, or you might also assign a set of beliefs to one partial physical state and a set of desires to a different partial physical state. But this is just the way that he frames it, and it's the way that I'm going to frame it from now on as well. The other thing, uh, and the quote doesn't quite, um, oh, the quite quote does justify this, but um, he also makes it clear that we're supposed to interpret these physical states in such a way as to maximize charity and rationalization for the population overall. So I have the quote on there if you want to read it for yourself, but later on, I don't have the quote for this, but later on he basically treats this as being equivalent to uh, saying that the interpretation of a state should depend on its typical causal role. Right? So you take some physical state of a person, you look at what it does um, in the average member of the population, and you try and assign an interpretation to that which is best going to sort of maximize those principles of um, charity and rationalization for the population as a whole. And then, when it comes to interpreting individuals, we're just supposed to look at what states they're in and then look at what the best interpretations of those states are. So we're not supposed to apply rationalization and charity on a one-to-one -one basis. So given that, let's sort of look back at radical interpretation and try and sort of uh, reinterpret what's going on with those principles of charity and rationalization. And I'll start off with rationalization, where uh, in introducing this principle, Lewis says that Carl should be represented as a rational agent, the beliefs and desires ascribed to him should be such as to provide reasons for his behavior as given in physical terms. And then he goes out to say that it should be described in Bayesian terms or decision theoretic terms, where essentially what we're going to do is assign to him a probability function or something close to it, 
uh, as well as a set of desirabilities for individual worlds. And then we're just going to be saying that the behaviors that they actually engage in should be the ones that maximize expected utility with respect to those probabilities and that set of desirabilities. So we could sort of rephrase that principle of charity, uh, sorry, principle of rationalization now in those sorts of terms. And I'm going to introduce this notion of R fit. And the reason why I'm using the term fit should become clear later. So we're going to say that an interpretation bell dares R fit, a total physical state just in case the typical agent in that state S will behave in a way B that maximizes expected utility with respect to that interpretation. And the point here is that this notion of R fit is going to correspond directly to a certain forwards looking typical causal role of a physical state, right? So just if you're in that belief desire state, then that is going to cause some behavior which maximizes expected utility in a certain sort of way. So I'm not going to read out that long ass quote that he's got for charity because it's really, really difficult to um, understand. So I'll just quickly go over what I said before. It's roughly expressing the idea that we ought to assign uh, beliefs, in the, uh, beliefs in so as to maximize epistemic rationality given life history of evidence and then basic desires which are appropriate. So in the Bayesian framework, this notion of epistemic requiety requires at least the following two things. First, that Bell is probabilistically coherent and second, that it updates by conditionalization. And I think, given this, it's helpful to break charity down into two parts. And they're going to be a causal part and a non-causal part. So letting bell E just be equal to bell conditionalized on E, we can describe the causal part of the principle of charity as saying that an interpretation, or two interpretations, bell des and bell E des, are going to C fit two states, S and S star, just in case a typical agent in S, when presented with some stream of evidence E, will come to be in state S star. And the idea here is, again, we're going to pick out a certain typical role. And this role is going to be both forwards looking and backwards looking. Right? So it's saying, if you're in the bell des state, you're given some evidence E, that's going to cause a new belief desire state. And if you're in that bell E des state, then that at least could have potentially been brought about by being in some earlier belief desire state, plus plug in some evidence. And that's one way that it could have come about. Ooh. OK. Where are we at? All right, and then as I said, there's also the non-causal part of charity, um, and I'm just going to be super rough about this. Here I'm just going to say that an interpretation bell dares is going to be better to an extent that bell and dares are reasonable relative to the agent's kind. And the reason why I say this is non-causal is just because it's not picking out anything to do with a causal role. It's just saying, you know, there are certain perhaps intrinsic features of the interpretation itself which are good or bad, or there's something about how that interpretation relates to individuals of that thing's kind um, which make it good or bad. So just quickly, what we could also do is take these two causal principles, rationalization and charity, and we can just plug them together. And what we get is a picture of a sort of overall functional role or overall causal role for a belief desire state basically says, you know, if you've got the bell des state, that's going to cause some behavior, plug in some evidence, that's going to cause a new bell state, bell des state, which causes some new behavior, and so on and so forth. So now, we still haven't got yet to this interaction question, and that's where the new work for a theory of universals helps. So my description or my reading of the quotes is going to go in sort of reverse order. So I'm going to start with charity, and then I'm going to talk about the principle of fit that, he, that Lewis talks about. And then I'm going to talk about some other things that he sort of implicitly characterizes. And this is all as in going backwards through new work. So firstly, or lastly, Lewis says, if we rely on principles of fit to do the whole job, then we can expect radical indeterminacy of interpretation. And he gives his argument for why this is the case. And since we don't want indeterminacy or not radical indeterminacy, then we need some further constraints. And here he says, this constraint should be of the sort called principles of charity or humanity. Such principles, in line with the way that I described it before, call for interpretations according to which the subject has attitudes that we would deem reasonable for one who has lived the life that he has lived. And then importantly, he says, these principles select among conflicting interpretations that equally well conform to the principles of fit. So we have these things, the principles of fit, which I'm going to define in a short second. We take the interpretations that sort of best fit with them. They leave some indeterminacy. And then we use these things, or this thing, the principle of charity, to filter between what's left. And then we pick the thing which, uh, we pick the most charitable interpretation which fits this principle of fit. So there's a sort of lexical subordinate role here for the principle of charity. But 
Whether this means that he accepted that the principle of charity as he described it in ra radical interpretation takes a lexically subordinate role depends on whether what he's talking about here is the principle of charity is the same as what he was talking about back in radical interpretation. And now I'm just going to say that's not the case. And the reason why it's not the case is because of what this principle of fit is. So a little bit earlier on, he says that we're going to say, and I've sort of changed the notation here just to make it consistent, we're going to say that Bell and Dez, this is really hard to read, um, rationalize behavior B after some evidence E, just in case the system of desires given by the Bell E expectations of Dez ranks B at least as high as any alternative behavior. We're going to draw a picture for what this means in a second. Say that Bell and Dez fit then, just in case for any evidence specifying E, learning E yields a state that would cause behavior rationalized by Bell and Dez after E, and that is our only constraining principle of fit. Right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna qualify that in one second because it's not quite accurate, but he also qualifies it, and I'm gonna say why. So we can re-characterize this principle of fit now, and it says that in interpretation Bell Dez, F fits a total physical state S, just in case for any evidence E, the typical agent in S when presented with some stream of evidence E will come to be in state S star that causes some behavior B which maximizes expected utility with respect to Bell E and Dez. So that's, I mean, you can just trust me, that is like literally uh, equivalent to what he says in that passage. So this notion of F fit is clearly supposed to capture two kinds of roles, two kinds of functional roles that beliefs and desires play. It's supposed to capture at least partially the role of evidence in the adjustment of our beliefs, and then also the roles of beliefs and desires in the production of behavior. However, we also know that it's not equivalent to the causal principles of rationalization and charity, and the reason for that is it's entirely forwards looking. And again, this is literally what he says, and he didn't, he didn't make a mistake here. This is literally what he says. The role that he gives us says that if you take some Bell E, you plug in some evidence, then it's gonna cause some state he doesn't say it's gonna cause some new belief desire state, it's just gonna cause some physical state where that physical state causes behavior which has a certain property. So the important part here, and the reason why it's entirely forwards looking is because the principle just as stated now doesn't assign interpretation to this S star thing. But as I said, while he did say there is only one constraining principle of fit, he then says immediately afterwards, where did the others go? We built them into the definitions whereby Bell and Dez encapsulate an assignment of content to, uh, to various states. So here's what he's referring to there. Uh, a little bit earlier than that, he says, Bell is a probability distribution regarded as encapsulating the subject's dispositions to form beliefs under evidence in the following sense. If a stream of evidence uh, specified by proposition E would put the subject into a total state S, or in short, if S, e, e, e yields S, then we are supposed to interpret S to consist in part in the belief system that comes from Bell conditionalized on E. And then he says basically the same thing for desires. And we can sort of rephrase these into, uh, into two uh, coherence principles. So one would be that S is interpreted Bell Dez only if for any st stream of evidence E, if you take S, plug in E, then that S star that results had better be interpreted as Bell E Dez, or in other words, you better be interpreting the states which are causally connected to one another in a sort of consistent way with one another. Backwards coherence just says the same thing, but sort of looking backwards, right? So if you've got some state, you're gonna interpret it some way, and that could potentially have come about by another state, plugged in some evidence with that, then you better interpret that er earlier state in a way that if you were to take that evidence and plug it in, it makes sense that you would be interpreting the later state in that way. So now, we can take that earlier principle of fit, plug in backwards and forwards coherence, and what we get is this general principle of fit. I'm not gonna read that out because I mean, I've put an equals sign there. It doesn't have to be exactly equals. It is at least approximately the same. The general principle of fit is basically the same thing as what you get if you take the causal rationalization principle and the causal charity principle. It just says you've got some Bell E, um, Bell Dez state. It's going to cause some B. And if you take some evidence and add that to it, it's going to cause a new state, which is also going to cause different behavior and so on and so forth. Right, so now we have enough information, given everything that I've said, to start answering our two exegetical questions. The first one was about how those two principles that he describes in rational interpretation, uh, radical interpretation, uh, are supposed to interact with one another. And the answer is kind of complicated, right? So the way that he understood it, at least later on, is that we've got this thing, fit with functional role or fit with causal role, and that's the thing that matters first. That's the thing which takes lexical priority. That leaves some indeterminacy, and then you get that non-causal non aspect of the charity principle, which is used to filter between everything that's left. Question two, and I have to be very quick because I've basically run out of time here. Uh, why did he not take, or why did he not talk about this? Because he didn't think it was very important. For the 
the following reason, and this goes back to what he says in postscripts. Uh, the interpretation of states depends on what they do in the typical case, and plausibly, I think, as a matter of fact, in the typical case, rationalization and charity don't pull in different directions, right? So in the typical case, people do behave rationally given what their evidence is. So agents who don't behave in a manner that seems pragmatically rational given what would be epistemically rational in light of their evidence are deviant cases. And they're exactly the sorts of cases that we should not be applying the principles of rationalization and charity to. And that's the reason why he didn't talk about that stuff. Right, and I'm done. And oh, yeah.